we're so glad that you've chosen to join us for this evening as we gather to explore our call to respond to racism from the perspective of our SSND charism, life, and mission, which calls us to commit and to witness to the struggle for unity in our divided world and to engage in the lifelong process of conversion of heart and return to love. We are so pleased to give a special welcome to sisters Addie Lorraine Walker and Limites Pierre Gillis, who will share with us this evening. I'm Sister Stephanie Spandel from St. Paul, the facilitator for this evening's event. And I'd ask each of the other vocation team members to introduce themselves. I'm Sister Nancy Gilchrist and I'm from Woodhaven, New York. And I'm Sister Bridget Waldorf and I currently reside in Dallas, Texas. And I'm Sister Carol Jean Dust, and I'm coming to you from St. Louis, Missouri. And I'm Sister Jill Leshefsky, and I'm, and I'm coming to you from St. Paul, Minnesota. So I'd like to give you a brief overview of the next hour. We'll begin with prayer, and then I'll give a, a, an introduction of our two speakers, each of whom will share with us for about 10 minutes. After their sharing, we'll have a moment to reflect, and then we will open the floor to questions and comments. Now, let us begin with prayer, the grounding of all we are and do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, who loves and delights in all people, we come before you in awe, knowing that the spark of life with each, within each person on earth is the spark of your divine life. Bless us this evening so we may recognize the differences among cultures and races as manifestations of your light. May our hearts and minds be opened in this communal sharing. Amen. So to introduce our two speakers for this evening, Sister Addie Lorraine Walker, would you like to raise your hand? Addie Lorraine, so we can see you for a moment, yes. has been a school sister of Notre Dame for 40 years. In fact, it's her jubilee year, and so we celebrate that with you. <laughs> she holds a PhD in religion and education from Boston College. She served as provincial leader of the Dallas province of SSND for nine years before it became one of the founding provinces of the Central Pacific province. And she currently serves as professor of practical and pastoral theology at the Oblate School of Theology in San Antonio, Texas, where she also founded and directs the Sankofa Institute for African American Pastoral Leadership. Sister Addie Lorraine shares her gifts as a pastoral and practical theologian in various university, high school, and parish settings, as well as with women and men in formation in religious congregations. Among others, she has offered workshops to religious congregations on intercultural living and building communities of peace, justice, and re reconciliation. In response to the Black Lives Matter movement and the widespread racial unrest in the US, Sister Addie Lorraine is currently facilitating several groups to actively identify racist policies and structures and become active, intentional anti-racists. Sister Limites Pierre Gillis has been an SSND for 10 years. And Limites, would you raise your hand so we can see who you are? Thank you. She was born in Haiti, where she began to attend law school before deciding to move to the US to join her family in Florida. In the US, she received a BA in political science and religious studies. And more recently, a Master of Social Work and an MA in Women's Studies and Gender Studies. Sister Limites currently lives in Towson, Maryland and works with Beyond Borders, a nonprofit organization working in Haiti hand in hand with the Haitian people to build movements to end child slavery, fight poverty, provide accessible and quality education for children and end violence against women and girls by balancing power between men and women, boys and girls. So again, thank you to both of you uh, for being with us. 
So to give a little context and just to, uh, to let you know what we've asked of them this evening. Racism is a challenging and painful reality. One that those of us who are white Americans have often been taught not to see, but that our brothers and sisters of color live daily. It is a systemic reality, not only present in the extremes, but in day-to-day -day realities that privilege those of us who are white in ways we often don't recognize, and that at the same time erect barriers for people of color. As SSNDs, we seek to be faithful to our call to respond to injustice, to continue to grow in awareness and conversion that leads to changed hearts. Sisters Limites and Addie Lorraine were given two questions to help frame their reflections for this evening. First, we asked them, from your perspective as an SSND, what would you like to share about the challenges of racism in our society and the gifts that may emerge from this moment in which we are living? And second, using a phrase from our SSND directional statement, quote, at this critical turning point in the sacred history of creation and humanity, how have we SSNDs heard this call to address racism and seek to grow in our call? We know that 10 minutes is not nearly enough time, but we hope that it will allow us to begin a conversation that we can then take home for continued reflection and engagement with others. And so we invite you, Sister Addie Lorraine, to begin. Wow, I, I seem to be having a little trouble with my sound. Every once in a while you cut out for me. So I hope I'm not going to be cutting out for you. So I, uh, let me know if I do. Uh, that's a new problem that I didn't know I had. And uh, secondly, no one or very few people in the world ask me to do anything for 10 minutes, but I'm going to try. <laughs> I'm going to try very hard to do this. Uh, I am a school sister of Notre Dame, and that's the, a very important uh, part of uh, how I need to begin. And this as a perspective of the school sister. So everything that I am about is being a school sister. So my life uh, actually is identified with what it means to be school sister of Notre Dame. So my perspective comes out of that. I live out of my constitution and the scriptures that I really hold very dear. So I'm a school sister. And what that means is that 40 years ago, I responded to what I understood as a call from God to give myself to a radical following of Jesus Christ. I used to sing, oh, how I love Jesus. I just love Jesus so much. I was so caught up in love with Jesus and I wanted to follow Jesus and I wanted to pattern my life uh, after Jesus. And I wanted to echo in my life what the scriptures had to say had in the mouth of Jesus saying, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And I wanted to go. In fact, I almost thought about being Jewish, but I said, no, I just wanted to follow Jesus. I wanted to do what Jesus did. I wanted to be one with Jesus and one with God and one with all creation. And what I just wanted, I began to learn new languages so I could be one and under, be understood by other people. I, I just wanted to be one with God and to do God's will. And um, yes, if, if you are thinking I was a little weird, uh, my family would probably agree with you. Uh, it probably is helpful for you to know, uh, you can probably guess, but uh, it's helpful for you to know that I grew up in a very segregated America. I went to segregated schools and churches until high school. When integration came to my city and we were forced to integrate, I encountered many angry and frightened white people. I decided at that time that white people were angry and afraid of integration because they did not know me. They did not know any other black people or brown people. So I, 
I made a decision at that time uh, to uh, meet as many white people as I could because after meeting me, they wouldn't be afraid anymore. <laughs> of course, I was young, okay. Uh, they wouldn't be afraid anymore. And then they would understand that uh, black people are intelligent and friendly and creative and capable and not threatening. So they and we could participate together in the vision God had for our world that all may be one. So from then till now, I entered different places and spaces and groups and churches and of different kinds as sent by God. That's, I feel compelled, sent by God to be a presence of God that would help people to include one another in time and space, that we would all include one another and we would have a vision for the whole world. And especially all Christians I would love to be with so that we, they know the same Jesus I know. So I thought, yes, we can work together to build God's reign. This mindset eventually led me to School Sisters of Notre Dame where our constitution is entitled, you are sent. That was the first thing that attracted me. I said, oh, that's my book. <laughs> that's my book, you are sent, that's me. And so I thought this is the place for me. And the first paragraph begins with the words of Jesus that are part of my mantra for myself. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world may they be one in us. I had found a home. I had found a home with people who had the same understanding of God's vision for our world as I did. However, the path for me has not been as simple and as easy as I thought it would be in finding my calling. As you probably have noticed, I am African-American and I grew up in the US where all the systems privileged white people. The education system, the government system, the medical system, the justice system, and even the church. And even I came to find out the religious congregation that I joined. When the coronavirus uh, pandemic hit us and, and the racial unrest, another pandemic, I think, hit us in the spring, I was forced to further reflect on the impact of racism on my life and on my world, on the people I love and on many people of color. People of color were more vulnerable to the virus than white people were or are. I had to ask myself why? And I discovered in doing some research and some praying and reflecting that the pandemic exposed the cracks in our social system. The disparity among the various cultural groups in the US, the disparity caused by so, the social disease of racism and classism exacting centuries long damage on black people, brown people and native American people all of whom I share culturally with. Racism exacts uh, disparities on people of color that are deep and affect every structure and policy, educational institution, medical and healthcare entities in this country, even in our world. And yes, even in our religious congregation. As I reflected on this, I was really, literally, unable to breathe. I in fact said to myself, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And then in May, George Floyd was murdered while he was calling out, I can't breathe. I began to ponder, why is it I'm experiencing this in this way? God, what are you asking of me? In fact, because I'm a school sister, what are you asking of us who are called to live your vision 
for the world, a vision of oneness. What is going on? So as a school sister, I, we are called to ponder like Mary in order to discover our response to critical issues and critical times that we live in. And so that's what I did. I began to re reflect and ponder uh, as a way of seeking God's will in this moment, in this time, ready, as we say as school sisters, ready to do whatever God would tell me, whatever Jesus would tell me. What did my reflections tell me I was to do or to be or to change and or challenge my congregation to do or to be or to change? Because each one of us is called to share in, in that discernment and to give our truth over so that we together make good decisions about what to do in God's world. A key reality I had to face was that the most that most of the white people I work with and live with, the sisters, don't identify themselves as racist or participating in some way in the racist structure. They don't. They see themselves as very kind and loving and good people. They don't understand uh, that any relationship to a policy that would cause me harm or day-to-day -day in inequalities that make up the fabric of our American life and church, or even our religious life for that matter. Most would say, because they are nice to me, they surely are not racist. Uh, we, we let you in our order, didn't we? They would say. Or they would say, when I look at you, I don't see color. Or they would say, you are so articulate and you fit in so well. Not like many other Blacks, so to speak. These statements and other similar statements have helped me realize that my own participation in my own order <laughs> and my cooperation or fitting in and holding helps to hold racist structures in place. When you don't challenge it, when you don't speak up, when you don't participate in being the solution, you are part of the problem like I am and was. So the fitting in and not questioning and not making suggestions about being more inclusive or culturally sensitive was my way of participating. I don't want to make waves. I don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable. I don't or haven't directly challenged the many ways of miseducation and malformation that have taken place over the years. All the prayer services mostly for the most part and liturgies and facilitation and food for the most part are reinforcement of strategies for a proper dominant culture living in community. Let's not make waves. Other ways or strategies are tolerated if they don't make people feel too uncomfortable or challenge the comfort of the majority. When we recognize congregationally, we need to change, we make chapter statements and we have made some beautiful statements uh, and we design projects that last for a season or for an experience and often we find ourselves checking it off and remain uh, the same. And we didn't fulfill that statement and we make a new statement and we go on like that. And so systemically as racism is to be addressed, probably we need a new look. It moves me to say, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe typifies my experience of our church as well where culture and interculturality are a project to work on rather than something organic and central to all that we are and do. And some think I should be happy to have an African-American choir, a song or presider once in a while, or on occasion mention a black saint or so. But when I began to look at retelling the story or reshaping the liturgy or rereading the Bible from an African and African-American sense, it's a little bit more difficult and a little bit more pushback. When I began to show African influences and on the development of theology at the place I work, 
I get a little bit more pushback. It doesn't keep me quiet as you probably can guess. Then I'm not so welcome and I began to feel that I can't breathe and I'm paralyzed. I see how that no longer is an acceptable posture as a school sister, as myself called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must teach, I must speak, I must preach, I must push to breathe, to speak up, stand up, show up and stand out with all the uncomfortable white friends and colleagues and sisters I have people who love me really and help make a difference for the millions of people that can't breathe because of racism, because of the pandemic of the COVID-19. This is what it means to be a school sister called to struggle for the unity, called to read, uh, to live in a way that all may be one to live in a way where we together have faith, to live in a way that we make a prophetic sign, that we are a prophetic sign by the way we live and we keep struggling. We can get it wrong, but we push to get it right. That we are that sign, a prophetic sign of the church today. And we are called and we are sent to deepen this communion with God and with every person in the world, among all peoples, wherever we are, in every place, in every time, in every situation, we are called to be one with God's creation. Thank you so much, Addie. I'm going to just invite us to pause for a moment to take that in. Much challenge and inspiration. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Sister Limites. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, good evening, everyone. And thank you for having me and thank you for joining us. Without you coming, we wouldn't be here because there wouldn't be any reason for us to be here. So thank you very much. Um, we gather together to reflect and to share on this important topic that has been making um, waves throughout not just the US, really the world. Um, I do hope that after Brianna Taylor, Karen in Central Park, George Floyd, and many, many more that happened, we all became a little bit more educated on this topic than we were before. Because um, to, to tell the truth, to tell you the truth, not that I have been lying, but I am not an expert in racism. What I know comes from my short lived experience as a poor black immigrant female from Haiti. So when I got the questions um, from Stephanie, I started um, reflecting on the challenges of racism as a school sister of Notre Dame. And I asked myself, where have we come from? Where are we? Where do we want to go? And how do we want to get there? Those are questions that can take us a while. We can sit with them for a long time, but we do not have this time tonight. For me, I found that the good news is that we already have a roadmap as a school sister of Notre Dame. It is our charism of unity, which is rooted in the gospel. And Sister Adi Lauren um, put that so well together um, in, in her presentation this evening. So one thing I did is that I picked up your sent, our constitution that Sister Adi Lauren 
um, mentioned earlier. Um, it gives, um, it has directives for our lives as school sisters of Notre Dame. I opened it and in the prologue, I read um, that Mother Teresa, which is the foundress of the school sisters of Notre Dame, she longed for the oneness of all in God. The most important word for me is the word longing. Her longing for oneness is modeled after Jesus himself who prayed so that they may all be one. So that they may all be one. Now, I think it would be fair at this point if you ask me, now what does that have to do with the challenges of racism? This is what we do know. We know that racism is this pandemic that has been killing people for centuries. But it doesn't just kill, it first divides. It divides us, it turns us into people of color, colored, non-colored, white, black, superior, inferior, good and evil, rich and poor, immigrants and non-immigrants, deserving and non-deserving, intelligent and stupid, beautiful and ugly, and the list goes on. We can even add human and less than human. That's what racism is, it divides. And then it kills. I heard this statistic not too long ago that in the US, every seven minutes, a black person dies prematurely. One third of black men in the US have been incarcerated, leaving families separated and children to become adults before they have a chance to be children. The challenge of racism really is that it permeates every aspect of the human life. Whether we look at it, we look at aspect to education, healthcare, housing, immigration. Every single aspect of the human life. Another thing we also know is that for centuries, people of color, in particular black people, have been fighting to be heard, to be seen, to be listened to, to be believed, to be, and to exist. As school sisters of Notre Dame, how do we make one? How do we erase this dividing line? How do we foster oneness? How do we transform ourselves and our world? That's the challenge for us. Uh, let me say that I find that there is good news. In the past few months, I have felt a sense of awakening. It's no longer just black people, or people of color taking to the streets only to be mauled by dogs or be arrested and put in jail. People are taking to the streets. It's not just black people. They are risking being arrested themselves and be put in jail. It's like for the first time, people see the pain. It's like they can touch it. They can feel it and they cannot help but to respond. Now, this is a critical turning point. People are speaking out taking actions, people are getting themselves edu educated on the issue of racism. And most importantly, I find that some people are listening. 
those are gifts that have emerged in the past few months. We as school sisters of Notre Dame or not school sisters of Notre Dame, we want to capitalize on those. We want to keep the momentum going. So as a congregation, we are struggling, I would say, but we are working to find ways to make it a priority to address the issue of racism and to work for the transformation of unjust institutions. Find that there are several activities that are going on within the province, around the world, as a congregation in general. We are making it a priority. We are talking about it. We are meeting sisters gathered together or with other groups to discuss, share reflections, pray, and to take actions. And if you are lucky or if you are at the right place at the right time, you might find sisters who gather in street corners with signs and banners, taking a visible stance against racism. Working to make one, fostering unity wherever we can. Issues that affect people of color and black people disproportionately are being addressed by the congregation as I find out as we are working our way to addressing this issue. Um, we are talking, we are working about like trying to do something about healthcare, education, immigration, and even climate change because we know climate change affects the poor, right? First of all, and because we are an international congregation, this, our internationality, and we read it in your ascent, really challenges us even more to witness to unity in this divided world. On a global level, um, we have sisters in other countries who are witnessing to unity, where division among groups are really crippling. Um, even we even have um, a few sisters who recently went to um, to South Sudan. I'm sure they are there witnessing to unity, fostering oneness. That's what we are doing as school sisters of Notre Dame, as an international congregation. These are meaningful actions. We are really moving, I think, in the right direction. But I do think that um, to really get to where we want to be as a congregation, as a world, as a nation, we need um, what I would call like a critical mass. It's um, a higher level of uh, collective mysticism. And um, since I, I don't know where I am with my 10 minutes, um, let me say that uh, I'm praying as we enter more deeply into the celebration of the season of Advent, um, getting ready to celebrate Christmas. Let us, let us pray for the grace to always be aware of the sacred in each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Limites, again, for your words of wisdom and sharing from your own heart. So again, I just invite us to take a pause and to reflect with what we've heard.